All right, welcome to Let's Accelerate live session. I'm Michael from Bosch Innovation Consulting. We're part of Bosch Management Consulting. And as my title suggests, we have something to do with innovation. Um, and today I've invited to what we call work placement students, I guess is one of the ways to say it, or you can describe better the role you had. I invited Lucas and Luisa to talk about their experiment, their experience in Bosch Innovation Consulting. Um, but first, I'd like to ask each one of them to introduce themselves, where you came from, why you came to our department, <laughs> why, why you thought it might be interesting, maybe it wasn't, but why you thought it might be interesting, um, and then we'll go from there. Let's start with Louisa. Yes, thanks, Michael, for inviting us. It's very nice to see you again. So my name is Louisa. I was an intern for the last six months at Bosch Innovation Consulting. And how I came to innovation, it's a little bit... Uh, a strange way because I was so long in uh, in the area of HR and you can imagine HR is more like a traditional traditional way of working so it's not that much um, of co-creating things with others together so of course there are uh, topics you can co-create with others but it's not so much and after my bachelor I thought okay maybe there should be something else than HR. And I was just checking what other opportunities can I have in that case. And then um, I was very fast in the in the area of business development and the startup uh, theme. And that was also because I did a little internship at Bosch at the UX department. And there they really showed me how a big company like Bosch can also be very innovative. Let's and, come back. Let's come back to this HR question, though. I have a lot of thoughts around this, and <laughs> actually, how much influence they should have on innovation and the structure of the company. But go on, keep going. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. And after that, um, I decided to do my master's in business development, um, and I saw that internship at Bosch Innovation Consulting, and I thought, oh yes, that's exactly what I want. And uh, to be honest, it was exactly what I wanted. It was uh, the perfect internship for my case. And I was very happy to be with you. Okay. And Sara, one of our colleagues, our <laughs> lovely colleague Sara says hi from the, from the comments. <laughs> yes. Lucas, Lucas, tell us about how you arrived there, why you came to us. Yes. Why you left Thank you. us. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I, I, will, I, will, I will start with you. Okay. So my name is Lucas. And I'm doing the junior managers program at Bosch, which is the trainee program, uh, or let's say the, that's what Bosch calls it, that trainee program. And I'm in the finance and controlling track. And somewhere in December of last year, I had an interesting discussion with my HR business partner. And mm -hmm. she said, I want you to also in, inside of Bosch see the new world right? Uh, the world where we are on the on the frontier, where we don't do the classical Excel SAP based controlling, but where we use new measurements and where we are, like I said, on the frontier. And then it all went uh, quite quickly. So I, I, I kind of applied, we had a little discussion and we saw it would be very nice for me to have a rotation at Bosch Innovation Consulting. And then that's what I did. And uh, I would say I learned a lot. I had a very pleasant time, very interesting time. And that's basically the story, how I came to Bosch Innovation Consulting. And unfortunately, of course, I had to leave at some point in time because the way the JMP, that's the abbreviation for the Junior Managers Program at Bosch is set up that you have certain rotations and they have a predefined duration. And at some point in time, this duration is up and you have to go to a new rotation. Um, and this is what, uh, what I'm doing now. I think for, for people, for the English speaking part of the world, you would call such a program a leadership development program. Sometimes they have them at the bachelor's level. Sometimes they have them at the master's level. I also joined Bosch uh, through this program and also did finance and consult, uh, controlling. And obviously I went a different path than, than finance and controlling, but maybe we'll come back to that. So I think my first question that I would have is, Often when people come through our accelerator program, and I think you witnessed this, they they have a certain conception of innovation before the program, and they have one that's fundamentally altered after the program we're going through it. What about in your cases? How did you see innovation before you came? And then what do you think about it now? I'll start with Lucas this time. 
Yes, I would say in my particular case, I had some some ideas about innovation, and I would say that those have been sharpened or or crystallized in a more clear way. So basically, what I what I what I knew or what my uh, initial idea about innovation was that you need to have two pillars on which innovation can rest. And one is the product part and the other is the business part. And the interesting thing is that depending on where you come from, you will have a bias in one of those directions. So I know engineers and they have a very strong product bias and they think you just build it and the people will come. Um, but that's just half of the reality. And then you have the business people who are kind of my peers, the ones I studied with, who think with marketing, you can solve everything. But in reality, you will need both. And at Bosch, I would say, since we are a very traditional hardware company with lots of engineers, the people who go into our program, who go, who, uh, go through the ACCP, the accelerator program, they have a bias towards the product side and they think the product is all there is. But we teach them as Bosch Innovation Consulting that you need to really investigate the business model because at the end of the day, you need to, to have a viable business, right? We talk about the, the desirability, the feasibility, and this is something most people underestimate, I would say. And for me, kind of sum it up, it has crystallized this, this notion that you need to have both a business model and a product and they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and you know, on, on top of that, and I think this is a fundamental misconception people have is the product is nothing other than the mechanism by which you deliver the business model, right? So the business, it's a part of the business model. Exactly. And I, and I think, that people have set it up in their minds is the business model is something those marketing people way over there do. And when I'm done with the cool engineering tech part, I'll just send it on. They'll figure out how to sell it. Which is, which is interesting because one of, if you look at the four P's of marketing product is one element there. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually you could argue it's all just, just marketing, but done right. Mm -hmm. Louisa. Yeah. Um, I think, when when people are not into innovation and know how how you can work with that they mostly think that innovation is some kind of magic so you just there's one big brain that is sitting in his that's me yeah. in somewhere <laughs> and it's a garage in silicon valley yeah, yeah it's the yeah. the the picture you have of innovators so it's one single person who is very intelligent and who is very innovative and who does this by him or herself but i think and that's something that i learned during the last six months that innovation is no magic so there is a really or there can be a structured way how to innovate and if you follow that way there is a big chance that you can get really successful with your innovation and i think that's that's very important to to know something like that because so many people i think they don't want to get started to do innovation because they think oh i can't do that that's too hard and i don't know how to start but you just need to get started and try things out. You need to fail. You need to to learn things, but you need to learn from your failures to to get better in that. And I think, for example, with the Bosch Accelerator program, there's a very good way to to learn, to do experiments, to get to know what the customers really need, and that's how innovation works. It's it's even worse. I think people have bought into this. What I would say is a mythology from yeah my native country, <laughs> the United States, they, you have to be one of these charismatic geniuses. Um, otherwise, you have no chance to succeed with a startup or with any sort of innovation idea. And they come from the garage and they fight against all, uh, all the obstacles and somehow they're successful by sheer force of their, yeah, their, aw exactly. their awesomeness, right? Exactly. And that's the, yeah. but, but that's what's missing in that entire picture is they only looked at one of those founders. The founder themselves was a product of a system called Silicon Valley, where there are, and I'm going to go into Lucas's slide they provided before about the game of probability. So it's a game of chance out there. There are thousands and thousands of bets being placed every day. And we only remember the successes, and nobody looks at that graveyard yep. of exactly. all the failures, right? Yeah. Any other the thoughts survivor, there? The survivorship bias is, is pretty strong, I'd say. So maybe explain what survivorship bias is to, to those listening. 
Yes, certainly. So you, you mentioned the, the, the graveyard. So um, imagine out of the whole population, uh, people try, let's say, a certain way, and you have many charismatic people, uh, and, and they may all do the same, but because we live in a very complex world, just very few of them, like the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates, turn out to be incredible winners. And then after the fact, we try to rationalize and explain why they were so successful. But what we fail to recognize is that maybe there have been thousands or millions of other people who tried the exact same thing, had the same charismatic uh, personality, but they failed. And uh, it's from a from a singular case, uh, especially the ones are, who are really, really successful, it's very difficult to draw conclusions and make generalizations. And then uh, when we when we do that, when we when we say this was the Steve Jobs method, uh, we, we fall victim to the survivorship bias because we 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 think this one particular case can be can be generalized. It's it's even worse, right? It's it serves our human arrogance um, because we survived. It must be because I'm so awesome. Yeah, but it's the only explanation because all those other people who failed, it was a failure of their character. It was a failure because they weren't so charismatic like me. And therefore, I survived. And the truth is way more complex, right? It could mm -hmm. have been just a random stroke of luck. Could have been you were a genius, right? But there are lots of geniuses who are failing every day. So yeah. it's somehow you have to find the right alchemy. And I shouldn't use the word alchemy, the right mix. Um, and, and then out of that, somehow will emerge these winners. Yeah. So let's. what I'd like to do now is Lucas put together these this list of things he's learned. I'd like you to both start commenting on that. And I think we already we already touched on this top point when we're looking at the big picture. So, Lucas, maybe read that first line and then tell how you understand it and then Louisa comment on it. Sure. So what I would say that one of my key learners is that innovation is a game of probabilities in a non-deterministic world. And what I mean by that is that at the end of the day, it's it's – you cannot say before before the fact whether something will be successful, but you can say if you use a certain approach, there is a certain probability of success attached to that. But it, because we, we live in a non-deterministic world and there's so many factors and variables you cannot influence, um, it's, it's not something you can plan on paper and can reliably produce, but it's more something that has a lot to do with luck and a lot to do with very small probabilities of success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Lucas. And I think the most important thing is that you see all of your business ideas, some kind of like a hypothesis that you need to validate uh, with your customers, that you see the chances you have, but that you don't take them for, for the real thing and that you always try to, to find the truth behind it. And the truth is always in a, in a co-creation with your customers. Right, and I think this is this very much like survivorship bias. This is very difficult for people to accept. Yeah. Yes. Because they've, and, they've sort of bought into this mythology that it, it's about me, it's about my character, but often it's not. It's it's timing's wrong. Customer doesn't care at all about the problem you think you're solving. I think that's already a third point. And but what's interesting for me because I, I think a lot about the cultural aspects of this is. If you believe in the, the mythology part, you, you essentially think that there are only a few people in the world that can innovate. That's sort of a depressing view of humanity, right? And then, then you have these pitches and somehow the judges are supposed to be able to pick the right character. They just know, but that's it's very depressing if you think about it. But if you think about innovation as a game of probability, it's actually more liberating. Yeah. In, in the sense that everyone has a chance, there's some luck involved, but if you just accept the math, then you can go through a structured approach, test hypotheses, guesses, however you want to call it, and then maybe your idea has a chance. But if it's all dependent on this mythology, then your idea has no chance because you as a person aren't the right person, right? Yeah. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. If you Did you think that before, more than mythology, or were you skeptical of it before you came? I would say I had a, I had a slight bias towards the mythology story, I would say. And this actually also ties in directly to this the second part, which is nobody can predict winners. Because at the end of the day, you look at the, the big venture capital firms in the US, you look at YC, you look at 
mythology people like Steve Jobs and actually his second startup Next failed. They've never been profitable. And I would say this in our culture, this mythology bias is pretty strong. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you when you think more about it and you learn about how things work and you try to analyze cases, you will realize that it's like we said here, it's a game of probabilities. And you, this is what's interesting to me. You come from a finance background, right? I you, do, yeah. should have, you should have known this, right, from looking at the stock market. But for some reason, when when people look at the stock market, they think they know it's a game of chance. Right? And we analyze it accordingly. Uh, almost all the finance I ever learned had that as one of the starting assumptions, right? It's a game of probabilities. Therefore, you need to diversify all that. Some reason when we go to innovation, we just drop all that. We forget it and we treat it differently. And I don't... I don't have an explanation for why that is. I just find it interesting that we do that. Louisa, did you believe you could pick winners before? No. And do you think you still can? <laughs> no, no. I, okay. I never thought you can pick winners and I still think that you can't pick winners. So I think you, you need to have a lot of ideas and you need to try your ideas. You need to, to validate your ideas. You need, you need to get in contact with customers and find out the truth. And I think um, it's very important that as soon as you somehow see that your idea might not be the, the real idea, that you um, have the courage to say, okay, I, I somehow need to stop that right now. Because if you already see that your idea won't, won't work, why should you still investigate your, your time and your resources in, in, in that thing? And I think that is a very hard thing to have the courage to stop working on on specific innovation ideas because you you somehow fell in love with your idea and then to say okay no i need to stop that now i think that's that's a very hard point mm -hmm. how will both of you manage differently now that you've embraced these two top points this game of probabilities and nobody can pick winners lucas how will you manage differently you think now that you know that um, I think um, maybe I will, I will use um, the, the, the notion you, you just mentioned with the stock market. I see a lot of similarities between the stock market and innovation because at the end of the day, the, the stock market is just a later stage of the innovation and the, the rules about failure and success apply there as well. And uh, I mean, we, we talk about market timing and stock picking and thinking about whether you can predict the winners there and you have the same realization. It's, it's difficult to do that. And to, to, to put that to a, to a conclusion, I would say for me, the way I would change my approach or adjust my approach is that I, I, I would embrace this more liberating view and saying, okay, um, take your, your biases back. Don't, don't be biased about the project because you think it, you have, when you heard about the project, you think it's a good idea or a bad idea. And um, this may be true or not, but in most of the cases, you need to really try it out. And so I would say, okay, this idea, to me, it sounds stupid, but let's try it. Or I would say, this idea sounds good, but we have to see what the market says, whether it will work. So to be less biased and try to be more open-minded and say, we need to let the market be the judge for, for ideas. Right, and there's, there's this, this sort of behavioral problem in management is to pretend that you know. Exactly. Right, somebody comes to you asking you for an opinion, and sometimes the best answer is, and I think it's often the best answer, I don't know, find out, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but I think sometimes it's just, there's this intense pressure on a manager to pretend they know when they don't. You know all the answers, yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Louisa, what about you? How will it change the way you manage in the future? Yeah, I think um, for for the leaders, it's more important to to enable people to to do failures because I think, especially in Germany, there's still a lot to do that the, the failure is not seen as something bad. So for sure, you you it's not okay if you fail three or four times with the same mistake because then you don't learn from it. But um, I think it's important that there is a cultural change. And I um, think there's a big way how managers or leaders can, can support that in that case to, to enable people to, to fail and to learn from that and to adapt their, their next working steps um, on their learnings. 
Right. And and I think for the listeners, it's important to point out that we're we're talking about a particular type of innovation, right? We're we're talking about innovation that's really something beyond your core business, something that's adjacent and beyond. And there the failure rates escalate very, very, very quickly to something close, probably close to 100 percent in a lot of corporations. So 99 point something. And that's just the part of the game. And in the core business, it's just the fact that you do know your customers better. At least you think you do. This is something I've learned over time, too, that there's actually lots of failure in the core as well. And I think that's also a lesson we can take from the work that at least we three have done out in the the far reaches of innovation in, inside a corporate back to the core business is to take some of the mindsets back there and don't pretend that we know. Be open to the fact that all business models can die and therefore we should always be aware. Uh, we should be answering all these questions that are coming up like, like uh, Lucas just points out here about customer problems. So how do you understand customers today differently than you did before or what we mean by a customer problem? Yes. So uh, you see this third bullet point here and it's, uh, it's actually a, a, a notion I learned from, from reading a very good book, which is about doing interviews, which is called the mom test. And it's written by an engineer turned business guy who kind of learned it the hard way, like a typical second time founder. And the notion here is that when you look at the engineering driven company, you have engineers and what they like to do is solving interesting problems and be fascinated about that and that they are very good at it. But the, the issue is, are you solving interesting problems or are you solving the right problem? And often mm -hmm. product development, even for, for mature business, uh, is, is very far away from the actual needs and requirements of the customer. And often people believe that they know and understand the customer by saying, I, I built something and the customer will want it, or I know the customer wants X, but you've never asked the customer whether he or she wants X. And the interesting thing is basically, and this is kind of a crisp summary of, of this, this notion, is you don't, you cannot tell the customers what their problems are. They need to tell you and you need to have a way by doing interviews and asking them about the problems and not biasing them with your product idea, but asking them in the past right. how they solved the problem, what they did. Not hypothetically, would you like to use a product? It's a stupid question, but whether how have you solved this problem in the past? And then it's the task of a company, of an entrepreneur, uh, of a startup to build a product. But the, you build the product and the customer has a problem and you solve the problem. Uh, and the customer doesn't tell you how the product should look like because you need you need to to answer this question based on the problems the customer tells you about. But you cannot tell the customer you have those problems because you don't know. You need to ask. I'm going to play the devil's advocate as you suggest in the last bullet point here. Often when you you're in innovation, you'll hear people say, "Well, sometimes the customers aren't aware of this problem. I know I'm right, and if I'm right, maybe I'm the next Steve Jobs." <laughs> And Steve Jobs will also confirm that the customers didn't know they had this problem. So what do you think about that? That there are times when there's a customer problem that's not, there's no awareness of it, right? In the customer segments. What do you do then? Do I would say this is this is one of the, the key notions. And um, I would say there's this quote, which is very famous, which is by, by Ford. It says, if we ask the people, they would say, we want faster horses. And um, I well, think I want a unicorn or a unicorn. <laughs> yes, you don't just want a, like a light, nice horse. You want, a, you want a unicorn. Pink. But but uh, Jeff Bezos in his in his book Invent and Vendor has, in my opinion, the, the answer to that question, which is to say, if you have really bold ideas, you need to use intuition, but you need to be aware that most of them will fail. And he says we right. have many failures at Amazon. And then once you have kind of established it, you need to take the customer into perspective as well. But often those those very, like the touchscreen keyboard was a big, big innovation by Apple. It's something where you need to try it out. Um, and for some cases, like the ones which are very far away from the customer, the customer doesn't know that they would use a touchscreen keyboard. It's very difficult to find that out. But, uh, and then you need to try in, in that particular situation. And then once you have more, once you see how the customer uses it, you need to incorporate this feedback. 
Correct. You still got to test it. I think I think this goes back to the mythology again. We want to believe that we're right, just by definition, because it's our baby. We want to be right about it, and it just turns out mostly our vision is a hallucination. And we're just basing it on our own perceptions. The other thing is, I think we don't think about there is, if you're going to do it that way, you better sure as hell be right, and you better have a massive cash cow behind you to fund your effort, because if you're wrong, you're going to burn a lot of cash, right? And so companies like an Amazon or a Google or even Apple could do that because they have so much cash behind it. Now, Louisa, what are your thoughts on customer problems now? Are they mm-hmm. different than, than what you thought before or how do you think about it now? Yeah, I think the, the role of a customer changed a lot during the last years, I think, because a customer, um, as Lucas wrote in in this uh, slide they know about their problems and they are more informed than ever so they can inform on the on any social media on the internet they can just uh, get all the information they need on specific products and i also think that um somehow- and even on amazon even on amazon yeah. it seems like certain people just spend their whole day on there writing reviews right yeah and there's like so a- much <laughs> yeah and so there's it's amazing Based on that, there there is so much more transparency between a customer right. and a yeah. company because the customers they can exchange, they can show how the products really work, and I think that's a big, yeah, it can be a problem, but it can be also a big chance for companies to to have that transparency to their customers, and I think um, with that transparency and with all the data the customers give to companies the customers also expect other kind of products. They want more individualized products. They think, okay, I give all the information to you, so I expect that you know exactly what I want and that you can deliver exactly the perfect fitting product for me. And that's the trade-off. With I mean, you come from Germany. It's a culture that's, I would say, in many ways obsessed with data privacy. So if I'm going to give you my data, I expect something really good in return. Yeah, so you, exactly. you really need to know me, right? Very exactly. good. Exactly. Another and- another devil's advocate question for you two then. What about IP? A lot of people are so afraid to reveal their idea because it might be stolen. I, I think it's or Louisa go first. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very stupid. And it's it's something people say, Oh, I have this great idea, but I can't tell you because I'm afraid you're going to steal it. Right. It's like it's like the corporate strategy. I we have a great strategy. No one knows it because it's a secret, you know? It's a secret, yes. <laughs> I think people have a, a big bias, and this is mostly for the people who who are not into the innovation theater, who believe that the idea is everything and that the execu- uh, execution doesn't count. But if you look at a, a certain idea, let's look at Facebook, like a, a, a social network. If you tell the idea, yeah, there's a network, you can share your information, it doesn't sound so crazy. But what's crazy is to have the whole execution, building the product that people actually want it, because for some reason, MySpace tried it and it was the configuration of the problem solution was not as good as Facebook or some other factors influenced it. And ideas are nothing, I would say. Uh, it's about how you how you execute them because there are so many ways to execute an idea and build something out of it uh, that the idea itself, if it's, it's, it's basically worthless. I and there's, a, there's a lot of psychology too, right? I mean, I know some of Apple's, Apple wasn't first, and I know some of the early competitors were naming their products something like XYZ542, never connected, right? Maybe it was technically even better, uh, but who wants to buy the XYZ542? They want to buy an Apple. It sounds cool, right? What about you, Louisa? What do you think about that? Do you agree with Lucas that it's sort of a stupid objection? Mm, I think it's it's more important that you somehow share. I think it's important to share parts of your idea and not give your your core competency to the outside. So that you share as much as possible, but not too much that anyone can just copy your your idea or work on it by themselves. But you need somehow need to be open to to get new ideas from other people. But because I think if you only do your idea thing on your own in your in your garage or some somewhere else you won't get so many ideas and you need different views on innovation you need diverse teams you need different perspectives and so on and i think that that's very important that you just share your idea with people but not not too much of it (laughs) 
I think my American compatriots like to say, you know, don't worry about IP, worry nobody cares at all. That's that's yeah. usually that's usually the bigger problem. But I think this this actually plays on a fear. It's this fear of rejection. And it's a more sophisticated version of another point you have here, Lucas. Do not fall in love with your idea or project too early. <laughs> right? It's it's trying to say, well, my project is so strategically important and it's the idea is so great. And there's an assumption behind that I'm automatically correct. Yeah. Never been tested. That's super risky if you think about it. And this maybe worked when the barriers to entry to business were much higher in the 50s, 60s, 70s, mass industry. But today with the open business models, you mentioned Facebook. I think Facebook is a great example of why IP maybe is not as important as it used to be. Literally any of us can hire somebody a couple thousand dollars to build Facebook. Probably don't even need to worry about IP. And not one of us will become Mark Zuckerberg. Why? Because it's not in the IP. It's in the problem that they solved. They hit it, right? Mm -hmm. Why others like MySpace didn't, I don't know. Sometimes it's random. We already talked about that. So maybe let's go back to that, um, back to the list. Embracing failure. This, this sounds like a buzzword, right? This sounds like a platitude that everyone says, embrace failure. Mm -hmm. Lucas, I mean, how, how do you, how can we get over that becoming not a platitude in corporate? I would say mo most of the platitudes have the problem that they are more, more said than done. So it's this <laughs> Latin, Latin okay. power, which is acta non verba, which means deeds and not words. And mm -hmm. uh, I think this is the problem with most uh, platitudes because you kind of intuitively know they are right, but the question is how do you act? And this is like a big, I would say this is a big dichotomy. You have this whole idea space, words, and you have this whole doing space where you actually do things. And uh, with failure, it's the same. Everyone says you, you should embrace failure, but most people are afraid to do so. And uh, it's because it, 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 it hurts your ego, right? And I, I would well, say- Even more, because I'm gonna come back to you with your HR comment. I have to come back <laughs> to HR. HR says this too, right? You go to an interview with them, What's the, sometimes. what's the method you use? Use the star method. The star method is I've never failed ever, and every success I had was solely due to me. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and even there, you, you talk about the failure, but then at the end of the day, you say, I learned from this, that, and that, and then I succeeded. So it's it, 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 it's still in that kind of, kind of a U shape. But, but we mean actual failure. Your project died, and it stayed dead. Right? That's what we mean exactly. here. Yeah, exactly. And that's so, okay. Uh, I would say yes, uh, particularly if you, if you think about innovation like a funnel, and uh, it's like a, it's like like a sales or a lead funnel where you know that there's a certain probability to go to a next stage, but you need to be sure or need to be certain that if there's some let's say no go criteria between stages that you need to stop because then you you don't you avoid spending or throwing good money after bad money, and for, for instance, I think. Jeff Bezos, who he, I mean, he's the richest man in the world, so it's kind of easy for him to, to be candid about that and say, we have so many failures. But actually, for instance, Amazon tr tried to compete with eBay and they had Amazon auctions and they spent billions to build it, but then they realized it didn't work. And actually, I think the whole, maybe it's because the whole a auction thing doesn't work because eBay is doing that and they, built, no and they built, anyway. a, built a phone and failed too, right? So. Exactly, and they failed too. But they then they, I mean, it was an experiment because the other experiments that Amazon did, like Amazon Prime, Amazon Web Services, they they have been usually successful. And then it's, it, I mean, if you have those successes, it's easy to have those failures. But um, and and I think then it's even easier to also say, okay, this was wasn't so successful. Like maybe Apple also with the HomePod which just discontinued after a couple of years, uh, kind of in a silent way, because obviously it didn't meet some of the targets. But to, to ensure it's not just a platitude, you need to say, I have the courage to stop a project if it is a dead horse, if it doesn't become a unicorn. Yeah. So Louisa, I'm gonna take Lucas's statement and say something stronger than what he said. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say, it's not just embracing failure, it's actually necessary to yeah. find success. Yeah. What do you think about that statement? 
Yeah, I'm I'm totally with you. I think I I know Michael, you once said that quote, and now I can finally quote you that uh, you need to fail enough that winners have the chance to emerge. And I think that's totally what what you need to you need to do fail or you you need to fail with ideas to learn how you can do it better in the next way. Right, and Sandra is just pointing out. I think what what Lucas was saying. This is, and again, this goes to this mythology. And I think as an American, sometimes when you're working in, in Europe, I think people have really bought into this mythology that like there there there's Apple and Google, and those are the only successes. And it was due to the the brilliance of the founders. And they only remember the successes. It's again this survivorship or this is more of a different bias, this is availability bias, right? I only remember those. The reason I remember them is because they're so damn rare, <laughs> right? I would, there's a, there's a nice website, it's, it's called Kill by Google, uh, that I think you should check out because it just shows that actually Google fails a lot. And if you really think about Google, they, have the same business model since the very beginning and they've just added sort of features along the way, YouTube, et cetera. And they haven't really fundamentally altered their business model. So one might argue, are they really innovating anymore? I don't know. Good. Now, HR, I want to come back to this. <laughs> um, <I knew> it. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite topics. One of the reasons I think innovation is difficult because I, I want to stick to this failure notion is that all of our KPIs are derived from the core business and they are derived to squeeze more out of the core business. Yeah. And when you go beyond the core business, those KPIs are often disastrous for doing innovation. Therefore, when HR is, is rating people, I think they're rating people who are too afraid to go out beyond the core because if they, they know if they go out beyond the core, they will disastrously fail to meet those KPIs. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm again with you. And I think there is one, one big important part that HR plays in, in the innovation game. They need to, because I think the, the business development innovation game, it always goes along with, with the change management. So you, you need to change a mindset. As we already said, you need to, to be open to fail. You need to be um, open to, to cooperate with other people. And I think their HR can play a big role to enable people to be like that. And um, mm -hmm. I also think, as, as you said, Michael, that um, in, in the ratings, for example, when you have one time a year, you have your your annual uh, meeting with your manager where you talk about your goals and your successes in the last year, that it's important that somehow HR in general um, designs processes that um, allow failure so that if you fail in a pro in some project or something like that, that that's nothing bad for you, but that um, as soon as you learn something from your failure, that's even better for you. And that um, these failures are also seen somehow so that you, you are visible with that and that you can bring um, some, yeah, something better to, to the whole organization with your learnings from that. Yeah, I think, I think HR has a, has a, has an issue or a challenge in that particular situation. Because we know from, from the psychology of, of startup founders, so there's this concept of the big five, which are like the robust personality traits. And we know that the, 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 the startup founders are very low in agreeableness, which yes. means that they are certainly, <laughs> yes. they, are, they are contrarian people. But as a, as a, as a let's say, a risk averse HR, person you don't want to hire people who are very low in agreeableness because they can, can you're looking for chaos. fit you're yes, looking for fit can, right what does can, fit mean they they will cause chaos in the organization and sometimes this is good sometimes this is bad but most likely they will cause chaos and they mm -hmm. especially if you want to use those people in a core business uh, they, they they are maybe detrimental to the performance um so as, as an hr manager you also kind of you also have your portfolio because you're measured on how good the people you hire are and if you look at it from a risk perspective 
and a expected return perspective as an HR person, it's much simpler to say, I hire the low risk kind of fitting in candidate who is very high in agreeableness, who will not stir things up, who will be kind of he or she is a, it's a safer bet. And hiring someone who's a bit crazy um, is, is a higher risk. And actually, there was right. an interesting yeah. interesting article. Um, and actually, my HR business partner from Power Tools commented on that as well. And it showed a CV of Steve Jobs. And it, it looked terrible. So it was handwritten and there were er errors in there. And then those HR managers were asked, would you have hired this person? And I like that. Oh, that my HR what would you mean? Of course not. <laughs> yeah, and he, he, I like that he was candid and said, to be to be honest, I would not have hired this guy because the, the, it looks messy, right? Um, and I, I like that this was because it was honest because most of them said, yeah, maybe I would have, but in reality, none of them would because it would have been a very risky hire. Yeah. And, and I like to tell the, the thought in the following way. It's kind of an anecdote. So imagine you're in with HR and they ask you this question either about failure comes in two forms, embracing failure, are you an entrepreneur? And if you answered it in the following way, of course I'm an entrepreneur. The first chance I get to leave this company with my own idea, I'm doing it, <laughs> right? They're not hiring you. There's not yeah. one chance that they're gonna hire you, although that might be exactly the type you need, <laughs> right? Somebody yeah. who's gonna take that extra risk, who's contrarian. It's somebody who hasn't learned socially not to say that. <laughs> That's the worst part about that person. They haven't learned what you're not supposed to say in an interview. Yeah, that yeah. makes them not a good fit for corporate in a lot of cases. <laughs> yeah, that's <Definitely>. right. <laughs> and um... <laughs> to, to, to come to come back to Steve Jobs, uh, I remember um, he hired Scott Forstall, who was kind of the guy who led the iPhone team, and Steve Jobs wanted to hire him. And uh, he had the first interview with that guy in the morning, and he told him, "Okay, in the afternoon there will be." three more HR interviews, please be honest, please be kind of a good, humble guy in this interviews. Um, I will, if they don't like you, I will hire you anyway, but you need to go through the classical process. So please just talk with them, do what they want, but I, I will hire you. Um, and it kind, kind of goes in the same direction. Mm -hmm. All right, next, validate key hypotheses that make her break your project. I feel like we spend almost all of our time on this. What does this mean? Yeah, I think that's as we, we already were talking about that you need to see all of your ideas as a hypothesis that that needs to be validated. So you I think that's very important um, in a connection between the don't fall in love with your idea or project and validate uh, the hypothesis that you don't just think, okay, I love it, so it must be good, but that you say, okay, I don't know if it's good, I like it, but I don't know if the customers will like it or if they will pay for, for the product or the service I will offer. And mm -hmm. that you more rely on the, the real data or the real customer feedback you get than on your, your gut feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this is exactly the point where you actually need to be very rational, like a scientist even, or, a finance person or controller and this is actually very interesting because it's counterintuitive of this mythology idea of intuition and and innovation mm -hmm. that you say okay uh, in order for in order to evaluate whether a project or a startup or whatever you are launching a new venture is successful there are certain things that need to be true and mm -hmm. you don't know whether those things are true or not and you need to validate them and you need to be very honest about that because this ties into this idea of not falling in love because many entrepreneurs are afraid because they love their product, they love their project. They are afraid to test the critical hypothesis because if the, if you invalidate this hypothesis, it would mean that it's likely that your project is going to fail. Um, so basically this action of insight encourages you to say, you really need, you don't want to work on a project and not validate the hypothesis uh, and then realize it, it was kind of a dead horse. It was not worth spending time on it. This is like, let's imagine wasting five years on a project like that uh, because you were too afraid to at, at, at the start to see whether this could actually work. Right. It's really just the, the scientific method, right? You're, you're better off mentally assuming that it won't work, right? And then if you cannot find disconfirming evidence, then it might work. You know what I mean? So it's really... 
it's really just the applied scientific method to go out and test those most critical assumptions and do it, do it at scale, try to get the repeatability, et cetera, for, for a company like, at least like Bosch, we're looking for big problems to solve. So you really need a lot more evidence than maybe a startup who, you know, a couple of million for a startup, that's sufficient for the startup founder to be happy with the result. But for a bigger company, you got to get a lot more evidence uh, to make sure that your business model scale. Let me take this off here now and ask you if you had any aha moments during your placement here. Anything that was surprising? Not surprising, but I would say something that, that I liked about the um, Bosch Accelerator program is this very big and lofty goal that we encourage all teams to do to conduct 100 interviews with customers. And uh, it's something when you read it first, you say, wow, this is a very big challenge. Why do you need to do 100 interviews? It seems like a lot. But it comes from this realization that you have a certain bias about how your customer looks like or what, what he or she wants, but you need to test it actually. And this to me is, I would say, maybe it's even the most important key takeaway uh, that you you may think you know the customer, but if you have not talked to 100 different customers and really learned about the problems of the customer, you don't understand the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And I, so something that was my aha moment was um, the way the the teams collaborate within within the Bosch Accelerator program. So it's not that one team does it by by itself. So it's more like a, they're all running through the program together. They are um, all working on the same topic. They are so they have their their own projects, but they they have the same problems somehow to to overcome and i think um that's one big advantage that the teams they are all together in this so they they help each other and they can do this together and i think there you, you get you have so much more spirit in this whole thing because you have people that are in the same situation as you are you can help them they help you and i think that's what we said in the beginning that is very important that you there you don't do this on your own you you do it with other people together you just get more insights and i think that's something that was very great to see um that also big companies like bosch do do it like that right and part of my job is in these accelerator programs is to to ask very hard questions and then sometimes that can be perceived as harsh, challenging, very challenging, yeah. confrontational. So let me ask you a hard question. Not everything is sunshine, rainbows, Hawaii, butterflies. Uh, what would you change about the way we do things in our innovation consulting? What could we do better? Mm, I think what, what could be very helpful um, if there is more transparency on different innovation initiatives at Bosch itself. Because I think for many people who want to somehow get started in doing something or that have an idea and don't know how to get started, it's very confusing because at Bosch there are so much initiatives, how to get started and how to validate your, your idea, for example. And so mm -hmm. I think if there is too much offer and a little bit too less transparency maybe it might be more confusing and people won't get started because they don't know how to get started and i think one big overview of all possibilities you have at bosch might help in that case mm -hmm. yeah my suggestion kind of ties into uh, what you, you just said louisa and for me it's it's basically going even one step further and saying we are kind of educators Right, we cannot. We don't build the products on our own, but we consult and we coach. Um, and I think one way to increase our impact is to use one of the the best methods to do so, which is to use a lever, because at the moment our lever is basically the size of the teams we are coaching. But I think if we if we look at the possibilities, we have 400 associates at Bosch, and if each of them just slightly better understands how innovation should work, or kind of would would listen to this talk. I mean, not saying we are explaining the world here but uh, every every single action we can take to increase the reach and the understanding in the whole company and um, that can create a cultural shift so the the suggestion would be 
use the biggest lever possible, try to educate each and every one of the associates, um, because this this kind of ripple effect this can create uh, will, will kind of create the necessary shift in the mindset of the whole organization. Let me ask another question as we start to wind down toward the end. Um, what was it like for you to work for us? What is the style of working in this team? And what will you take from that going forward? I would say what, what, did, what did you work what did you work on? Not, yes, I, mean, just a, I, I was I was, I was mostly involved. So I'm a very I would describe myself as a very process driven, methodical person. So like I was me, mostly like me. Yes. You're gonna laugh. Still um, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so I was mostly, it's totally not true, right? Okay. I was I was involved in, in setting up uh, repeatable processes for, for various like for internal KPIs we have, for elite tracking we have set up uh, for our content pipeline we we have for LinkedIn um, because I think the the team was involved with a lot of coaching tasks uh, and I saw myself as someone who kind of brought a bit of structure in the processes and facilitated them um, and what I told also to Uwe in my in my final um, interview for, um, about this rotation for me was that what I really liked about the team and I said there were, there were, those are the three T's is the topic Right. Everyone wants to talk about innovation is the tooling, which is like our team setup, which we had, which was also Louisa was a, was a great role in there by using all the types of gifts and having a good kind of community and was the, the team. Right. Because we had a very, uh, very diverse team, different nationalities, different levels of seniority, different skill sets, which really complemented each other. And that's what I really liked. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think. I think that's the, the three T's um, exactly explain how, how the whole team works and how it all fits together. And I think um, as the, the topics are so diverse, no, no day is like the other. So you, you don't have the tasks you need to do every day because you, you go to the office on, in the morning and then you just see, okay, what needs to be done? Where can I bring the most impact? And how can I design or try to develop um, the way we work together. And I think that was that was very great in the different topics um, I could work on. And what I really appreciate so much is that you can really do things. So it's not just, oh, here is something you need to do some copies and you need to bring me some coffee or something like that. So it's not an internship internship, but it's more like you you can do things on your own. You, you, you get enough um, you're you're allowed to have thoughts, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the exactly. HR person would call that empowerment. So <laughs> yeah. we were actually empowered to do yes, things. Yes, one hundred percent. And I think that's that's not normal for internships that you can um, design things on your own and then that you can just say, oh, I would do it like that, and then people say, okay, let's do it like that. Why not? And I think that freedom of showing your your thoughts your ideas that is very important in in that field and i think that's why the team works so so perfect yeah maybe maybe one last sentence to this to me it felt like working a bit in a startup so it the, yeah. the, the whole setup was similar to what i've experienced working in a startup in, in one of my internships during during my university time uh, and it it was really very like you lisa you said it's very dynamic yeah no day was like the other and you could really like move fast and break things and it, it was really interesting all right let's finish it with maybe a sentence about innovation and going forward what, what is your hope for um company society whatever related to in innovation because hmm. because things are things are crazy right now right pandemic hit I think you're yeah. in your fourth, fourth lockdown over there. Um, how important will innovation be going forward? What's your final thought as we sign off? I would say entrepreneurs are heroes. It's it's the modern day version of being a, being a hero, and it's it's this notion that individually entrepreneurs are very fragile, but collectively the whole the whole innovation theater is very anti fragile as Nassim Taleb would describe it, robust. because yeah. it's, it's robust, <laughs> even more, like even more. So yeah. the whole, let's say, if you can see it here with the, with the crisis, the whole Corona situation actually may have been very positive when it comes to entrepreneurship, because 
it, it made people work in new setups and made, the, made them work on new problems. And it may even drive the whole, let's say, education in Germany, which has kind of been in the Stone Age, uh, may be driven uh, and, and become more uh, how it should be. Uh, because as a whole, being an entrepreneur, working on a project is, is bringing society forward because the whole civilization we are standing on are is, has been created by the giants and individual people, the ones who failed and the ones who succeeded, because it's the whole package. It's not just the, the winners who, who, who are mythologized, but also the whole, all the ones who tried, because if no one tries, there will be no winners. So will you stay in innovation? Will you be a hero or not? I hope so. We will see. <laughs> only, only time, only time can tell. It's, like we said, it's difficult to predict. True. true. Okay, Louisa, final mm -hmm. thought? Yeah, so I, I also think like like Lucas already said it, it's important that you just do innovation so that you aren't afraid of failing. Just just do it and learn from your insights. And yes, be a hero. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Luisa, Lucas. We I know I speak for our team. We had a great time with you in our consulting efforts and we would all love to have you both both back full time. I'll just say that. I have no shame saying that. Um, so thanks for sharing your thoughts, what it was like working with us. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>